richest man in the world. Who's the richest man in the world? Does anybody know the answer to that? Elon Musk. Only reason I know that is because my students wrote a paper on uh, money about a month ago, and uh, I think he's worth like $36 billion or something crazy like that. Um, did anybody play Powerball last week? The Powerball jackpot, I think it was $1.1 billion was the payout. 2.1, thank you, Lou. Did you play? <laughs> okay. But when it gets to be that high, you do start to think, well, maybe a buck or two, what's the, what's the harm? I actually, when I walked into Fred Meyer, I think it was the day that it was going to be drawn, I had half a notion to walk over, and there was already a line of people waiting to buy one, and I thought, okay, we'll let them do it. I think my odds are really bad. Um, and I, I have to be honest with you, I've said this before to other people, I don't want $2 billion. Can you imagine the amount of problems you would have if you had $2 billion? And uh, that leads me into this initial quote here. Henry David Thoreau says this. I quote him often. He's got a lot of interesting things to say. He was an interesting guy. He said, a man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. And that's really true in life, isn't it? Ultimately, what is wealth? But being able to not have stuff, understanding that I don't need stuff, that stuff in a lot of ways becomes a burden and an encumbrance upon me. And if you've ever cleaned out your garage, like our household did this past week, you realize you got a lot of stuff sometimes. You do. And I, in reading a, a piece that I share with my high school students, uh, it's called On Dumpster Diving. And it's written by a man who literally was homeless and dove in dumpsters to find his sustenance. And he provides some advice to the reader at the end of the piece. He says, every time you think about acquiring another object or buying another thing, imagine the moment that you're going to be throwing it away. And I thought that is really profound advice today. And I think that ties in very nicely with the scripture passage that we have today, speaking about wealth and Christ dealing with the rich young man who came to him in Mark chapter 10. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. Let's look at our passage here this morning together. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. If you are like me, there have been times in your life when you have read this passage and it has bothered you. This is one of those troublesome passages that if we look at it in a certain light, seems to imply that we're all doing it really wrong. 
that each of us, if we have possessions, should have sold them a long time ago and given them to the poor. And by the way, there's not anything wrong with that, but that's not really the intent, I don't think, of Mark recording this interaction that Jesus has with the rich young man and with his disciples. And so it's important, I think, to understand the nature of the conversation, what some of the underlying premises are, and how we can apply that to our own understanding of our own spiritual walk. Who is the richest man in the world? Well, we see that this encounter starts with a man who comes to Jesus, and it doesn't just say he walked up. Please notice the detail that Mark includes. It says the man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. And then he says, good teacher. And one of the things that used to be a misconception for me in this exchange is when Jesus replies, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I thought that Jesus was being kind of pedantic, like bothersome just to be bothersome, like kind of already didn't like the guy very much, and so he's trying to sort of dismiss him. But the more I've thought about this passage over the years and the more I've considered the heart of Jesus, the more I realize what he's really trying to do. Jesus, in this conversation, after the man comes to him with, I think, a very sincere question, Jesus responds by clarifying the stakes. What is going to matter in this conversation? Why does this conversation matter? I don't know what kind of answer this rich young man wanted. I don't know what he anticipated receiving from Jesus when he came to him in faith, Asking for some information. He obviously cared about his eternal soul. He obviously was a dutiful person who believed in the the power of God's law and its necessity in his life. And so in his approach, Christ is providing some clarification. Jesus is helping the man recognize just how important this conversation is going to be. In other words... Do you realize who you're asking this of? If you're calling me good, understand, there's only one who's good, and that's God. And that's who you're talking to right now. Well, that reframes the issue, doesn't it? So Jesus becomes more than just a good teacher, a good rabbi, someone who's got a following. Now the stakes have been raised. Because if a good teacher gives me a response... I can still think he's out to lunch and walk away. But if God himself gives me a command, I have to listen. Especially if I'm a devout Jew who cares about the state of my soul. One of the important things about living in the kingdom is recognizing that when Jesus speaks, your king has commanded you. If you walk in his way and you're a part of his kingdom, When Christ speaks to you, it's not just a good rabbi talking. It's not an inspirational quote for the day. It is your king who commands you. Let's talk about this question, which, of course, should be the question that every single human being asks themselves at least once in their life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So the eternal life part, obviously, is a concern because we understand in our own frailty we will not live forever. And we understand that even if this rich young man was, had great wealth, he understands life. He can't take it with him to the next life. Or he understands that he can't buy his way into more years. What must I, and now, what must I do? Let's talk about that question just for a moment. What must I do, that part of the question? The law to a devout Jew, to someone who really wanted to follow, um, to be a believer in the Jewish mind, was to obviously look to the law as the way to get God's favor. And this man had already received God's favor. He had been blessed. He was rich. He probably, 99 out of 100 people in the Jewish culture would have looked at him and envied him. 
for the way that God had so richly blessed him. But isn't that interesting that the man who probably had what many other people couldn't have still has questions? And that's instructive to our heart today, that if you believe that just a little bit more is going to be the answer to your question, let Scripture guide you and disabuse you of that notion. The man knew that there was something missing. He has gone to the right place. He's gone to Jesus for the answer. So, so far, so good. This took faith. His posture is correct. He's kneeled before the Lord. He's respectful. He's reverent. He's not approaching Jesus as someone who is above him. What does Jesus do with this question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus points him to the law. He says, well, what about these commandments? And he lists off, I think it's five here. So this idea here that the law is the way that we can do things to inherit eternal life is very much rooted in Old Testament teaching. For example, Deuteronomy 30, 15 and 16, God says to his people, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, for I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws, and then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. If someone wants to earn their salvation through their works, God has shown you the way to do that. You can do it by upholding the law. In the law, there is life. And so this man happily responds, oh, that, if that's all I have to do, that's good, because I've done all of that since my youth. Now, I don't know if this man was deceived, or I don't know if he really was the best guy to ever have lived, but we have a tendency when we know what's expected of us, if we just do that, we can feel pretty good about ourselves. Honoring your father and mother. He was able to do that since his youth. Never one cross word to his mom when she asked him to take out the trash. Never one eye roll to his dad when his dad said, son, you better shape up. Seems hard to believe, doesn't it? But let's take him at his word. Let's, let's imagine for a moment he was the exemplary child, adolescent, and now adult, and that he has revered God's law as much as it can be possibly revered by human beings. Here's the issue that Jesus is about to point this man to. The law gives life, but for human beings, it is always just out of reach. And that, of course, is some of the real burden of life, is that we know the good that we should do in life but we realize that we don't measure up. Or we delude ourselves into thinking we are measuring up when we're really not, even more dangerous. And so Jesus, in starting where this man was, is going to lead him to his real spiritual need. And I just want you to think about that for a second, the example of Christ here. You'll notice at no time does he say, Oh my gosh, you are so off. He starts where the man is. Where are the people in your life? It's quite possible that some of the people that you are called to minister to don't even believe in sin. It's quite possible they don't even believe that there's a God. It's quite possible they believe the Bible is complete hogwash. But where can you start with them? Do you see where that starting point comes from? Does it come from a mastery of Christian apologetics? Does it come from a perfect life? No. The Bible says that Jesus looked at this man and loved him. Loved him. So when you're walking in the kingdom, in your Christ-like pursuit of his example, can you look at the people that God has put into your life and love them no matter what their starting point is? This guy's pretty far along. 
He understands the law. He knows the law. He's tried to keep it. He obviously has had a family who has brought him up with a knowledge and a fear of God. He goes to Jesus, the right spot. He's so close, it seems. And you don't know in your own life where people are and how close they might actually be to the kingdom until you find out where they are. I just want to pause here and reflect on this. This was always a verse that I had sort of dismissed or not really paid a lot of attention to. Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's sometimes, and I think this story was taught to me in Sunday school, that Jesus is setting up this elaborate trap for this rich man. He's baited him into asking him a question, and boom, he's going to spring it, and this trap's going to shut on this guy and just wreck his whole world. That's not Christ's intent. Some commentators mention that in this passage, you can almost envision Jesus after the man gave his answer of giving him a big hug. Do you ever think about Jesus giving the rich young man a big hug? You have to sometimes put yourself in that position as the recipient of that great love. So you're giving answers to Christ, you're walking with him, and there's probably times where you yourself are deluded into believing the wrong thing about yourself. And all this time, Jesus isn't trying to trap you. He's not trying to stick you in a vice that you can't get out of. He's looking on you, and he's loving you. He's looking on you, and he's loving you. Have you ever loved someone like that who is just missing the boat? And you get maybe your internal reaction would be frustration, impatience, uh, just a real, why aren't they getting this? This seems like a no-brainer. This person should be all over this. And you ever just look at them and just love them instead of venting all of your thoughts about their inadequacies? I've had to do that a few times in my life. I'm sure you have too. I would suggest doing it more often. When you are feeling that building up of this person's off base, if I could just get them on base, take a step back before you try to fix them for a moment and just look on them and love them the way Christ would. I think that there's a sincere love being portrayed here in the scriptures. It's not just a superficial, oh, I feel bad for this guy kind of love. I think it's in a deep and abiding love for this young man. Here's the thing. If there's a relationship that has any depth with it whatsoever, if there's a strong impulse for you to really love that person, not just in a looking way, but in an active, loving way, at some point, you have to tell them the truth. One thing you lack, one single, solitary thing, is all you lack. You have to tell people the truth. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. I want you to note for a second that we focus a lot on the first part of that command and we don't necessarily pay as much attention to the second part. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Ugh. Yikes. Wasn't expecting that one. And you will have treasure in heaven. So before I move on here, there's an incentive structure built into the kingdom of God if you have faith to see it. What Jesus is doing when he tells this man this is he's trying to provoke him to faith. There's just one thing you have to do is you have to trust me enough to get rid of all this stuff you have and trust me enough that I'm gonna give you even more now and into eternity. And I would ask everybody here, do you have that same level of trust that Christ, while he often takes away, also gives in full measure? He's gonna talk about that a little bit later on in this chapter. This is ultimately the cost of surrender, and it is the beauty of the gospel. Jesus is trying to nudge or push the man into saving faith. 
There's other ways the poor could receive that guy's money or anybody else's money in that context. What Jesus is trying to help the, the person understand, you cannot do enough to earn your salvation. You have to trust me with all you have. Total surrender. And you come follow me. And you will get incentives beyond your, you could possibly imagine. And I used to not like this story when I was a kid because it made it seem like you had to do something extreme to be saved. But I misunderstood the story. Submitting to Jesus is not extreme. It's just a surrender. And when you surrender, things by definition change. Perhaps it's radical, but I don't think it's extreme. The Bible says that at this man's, that once Jesus said this, at this, the man's face fell. So you can imagine I'm not a very good actor, but I'm sure you get the idea there. And why did he go away sad? Because the answer was bad? Because Christ had not proclaimed it clearly? Why did he go away sad? Because he had great wealth. Great wealth, the Bible says. I want to say this, and I believe it to be true with my whole heart. No one ever walks away from Jesus happy. People walk away from Jesus angry. People walk away from Jesus because they're being uh, kind of hardened or, or selfish. They can walk away. They're disillusioned. But no one walks away from Jesus truly happy. And I've read testimonies from people who proclaim to be Christians and walked away from the faith, and they're asked, what, is there anything you miss about your previous life? And they've said, I miss Jesus. And that's an important warning for us, that when we're out in the world and there's a temptation or pressure to walk away from the kingdom, you make that choice, but you're not going to go away joy, joyful and happy and at peace. There is great joy in obedience, great sorrow ultimately in disobedience. Maybe not right away. But the cumulative experience of following Jesus points us towards joy and peace, incentivized rewards. I have prepared a place for you. I have a path for you. It's narrow. It's straight. But if you walk it and you follow me, rewards unimaginable in this life and in the next. The camel in the eye of the needle. I think we have to take Jesus at his word here. So I do take him at his word when he says it is difficult for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of God. And by extension, it seems to be the more wealthy one is, the less likely they are to offer that complete surrender to the Lord. This appears to be an immutable spiritual law. Jesus says in Luke 12, uh, 20 through 21, this is the parable of the rich man. God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Everything you buy in this life, imagine the day you're going to have to throw it away. Everything you purchase in this life, imagine the date it becomes obsolete or the battery dies, or the engine wears out. If you're not imagining that day, then you don't have kingdom principles. The camel and the eye of the needle. I thought this was an interesting thing to think about. I think that the Bible is true. I don't think that hopefully radicalizes any of you here. But this is some information, if you can't see it very well, this is from uh, the Cor Gordon Cornwell Theological Seminary, their Center for the Study of Global Christianity. So, uh, Christians, the year 2000, where we are right now, mid-2022, then they project out to 2025 and then to 2050. The global north, 
Okay, those are two regions of the world, North America and Europe. In the year 2000, roughly 814 million Christians. Today, roughly 837 million. They project by 2025, 828 million. And by 2050, 772 million. You'll notice that those numbers are going down. And most of you are probably aware enough to know that North America and Europe are the two most secular places in the entire world. What happens when you get wealth, when you acquire wealth? It's tough to enter into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus says. That's not my sociological interpretation. I'm just taking him at his word. You look at the global south. This includes South America and Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia. 2,000, 1.1 billion Christians, roughly. I rounded down in most cases, so those numbers are actually higher. 1.7 billion right now, 1.8 billion projected in the next three years, and then by 2050, 2.5 billion. Where is the Holy Spirit working in the world, church? It appears to be the global south, the places that are poor, the places that are open to the gospel, the places that don't trust in their own riches, the places that don't have three cars and two houses. The unevangelized population goes from 1.8 billion in the year 2000 up to 2.7 billion in 2050, if those trends continue. Obviously, those projections are not gospel, but they give you an idea of where things might be headed. So why does that matter to us? Well, are you rich? The answer is, contextually, probably yes, given the perspective between the average person who's sitting in this pew and the average person who lives in South America or Africa. Typically speaking, you are wealthy. Now, on one level, that seems like it's really bad news because now I'm a cam camel trying to go through an eye of a needle, right? That should really cause us to perk up and pay attention a little bit. But wait a minute. Christ isn't just talking to that rich young ruler. He's talking to me. Thankfully, God provides a way. You look at verse 27. The disciples are really, really bothered by this teaching because they've been led to believe their whole life that wealth was God's favor on you. And here Christ is saying, it seems like the opposite. Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, remember the disciples asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God all things are possible with God. You, as a potentially wealthy person, are saved not by your own merit or by your own accrued wealth or your ledger sheet or your bottom line. You are saved by the miracle of God's grace in your life that someone either raised you with a Christian heritage or reached out to you as witness to your life so that you might know the goodness of Christ. And if not for God's intervention into your life, you might be too rich to ever feel the need for him, ever. It's really tough, isn't it, sometimes, to evangelize to people who have a pretty good life, who seem like they got most things together. And of course, under the surface, there might be this or that. But it seems like some people just... Float through life, no problems. I'm going to say one more thing about this. Oftentimes in life, the question comes up, well, should I give? And how much should I give? Clearly, there's a need. And if you feel helpless, like, I can't go to South America and evangelize this village out in the middle of nowhere where these people are receptive to the gospel. I, I, it's too much money to fly on the plane. I, I can't, at my age, I can't travel anymore like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm relatively restricted in what I can do now. And I would just say this. If you can't do it yourself, finance a proxy. You know that governments have done that in the past? 
if uh, you, as a wealthy person, didn't want to send your own son off to war, you would pay someone else to go. And so if you're wealthy by the standards of God's kingdom and you can't do it yourself, you got to give till you get the faith to give more. you got to send your proxy. There's missionaries who need your work. As I showed uh, last Sunday, or when I, was that last Sunday? No, two Sundays ago. There's churches in Ghana that need to be built. There's people in South America on boats spreading the gospel to other places. There's orphanages. There's hospitals. There's all these ways that we can impact the kingdom with our money because we've been entrusted with the responsibility of wealth. I love Peter. I love him in this passage. Hey, Jesus, if that's true, can we just be straight about this? We've all left everything. What will it be for us? I was never someone in life who had a lot of nerve. People have often, my dad would even say this, John, you just got to ask for stuff sometime. I never had enough nerve to ask for stuff. And when I was a kid, my cousins lived next door to me. My cousin Jeff, he had a lot of nerve. And, for example, there was a guy who lived behind us who had a pool. I was never brave enough to ask, hey, Jay, can we go swimming in your pool? My cousin Jeff would ask. You needed Jeff sometimes. <laughs> the disciples had Peter. What, what will be left for us? Now, the response here is quite surprising, isn't it? When Jesus says, uh, truly, I tell you. In other words, I'm really emphasizing this. This is really the truth. No one who has left their home or their family or their fields, their work for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much. You see, what the rich young man didn't see and what he couldn't anticipate because he lacked the faith to see it was the rewards of surrender. Christ continually tells each person at this moment of decision, if you offer me you, don't worry about it. I will take care of the rest. And we struggle and we wrestle and sometimes we go away sad because we have great wealth or a great lifestyle, great comfort. Just a reminder, Jesus caps off this message with this statement. Many who are first will be last, and the last first. The kingdom of God will always be upside down. Many will think that they're on top, will be on the bottom, and vice versa. There's a story I'd just like to end with here in the last minute. Uh, it's a short story called Revelation. It's about a woman who goes through life thinking that she is one of the good ones. And as she goes through life, she spends most of the story remarking on all the people that are, she wouldn't say this out loud, but are beneath her. Some of them she calls trash. Some of them are a different race, and so she judges them for that. Well, one night when she's out feeding her pigs, she has a vision. And in the vision, she sees people traveling up to heaven. And the, the author says, she saw the streak as a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth through a field of living fire. And upon it, a vast horde of souls were tumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash cleaned for the first time in their lives and bands of black people in white robes and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs and bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people whom she recognized at once as those who, like herself, had always had a little of everything and the given wit to use it right. She leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were on key. Yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces even their virtues were being burned away. And she lowered hands and gripped the rail of the hog pen, her eyes small but fixed unblinkingly on what lay ahead. In a moment, the vision faded, 
but she remained where she was. It's a good reminder to each of us in the kingdom of God that if you think you're on the top, you're probably on the bottom. And if there are times in your life where you feel like you're on the bottom, the Lord Jesus sees you and he wants to reward your faith and your trust in him. May it always be true that in this life, the first last and the last first. Pray that God blesses his word. Let's all stand for a closing prayer and a closing hymn. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word that you have. Your word is very clear to us, Lord, that we need you, Lord Jesus. There is no other way. Lord, we uh, pray that <laughs> let each of us examine ourselves before you and, and uh Lord, we pray, give us grace to follow closely to you. We thank you that you have provided this way of sure salvation for all that will surrender their all unto you. Lord, we pray, help us to walk with you in your path. Lord, we pray, draw many more unto you. Help us to be a light to the world uh, that many more could hear your word and see your, your life lived in our lives, Lord, to be a light. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all close with number 815, 815.